we're talking today with Jay Lindquist of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, uh, Jay, can you begin with some background on yourself? Uh, I'd like to say, <clears throat> as we get, get into this, that this is like a timeline of the events right. as best I can recall, and also from records and things of that sort. I've not included any information about family in this. Uh, I'm just strictly going to relate what my uh, career path okay. was. Well, why don't you start with uh, where, you, where and when you were born? Okay, I was born in uh, Chicago, Illinois, on the 15th of November, 1934. My parents were Harold Kenneth Lindquist, my father, and my mother was uh, Mildred Louise Fries Lindquist, Fries being her maiden name. I did all of my uh, uh, education at, uh, in Chicago, except for one year in high school, in public education. So elementary school and high school was all done. And at, what part of Chicago did you live in when you were growing up? Well, I was born on the south side of Chicago, which is why I'm still a White Sox fan, about 6,800 south. And then in 1941, we moved north. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be closer uh, to my grandmother and to good transportation in schools. We never had an automobile, and my parents never had driver's licenses, so we just ran public transportation. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, in the area of 3200 North and about 20 West in Chicago, and the, the address was on Walcott Street. And then later we moved uh, just a few blocks uh, farther south, but fundamentally we're in what's mm -hmm. called the Lakeview neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the elementary school I went to was right half a block from my home. It was called the Yon School, J-A-H-N. And the high school I went to, I went one year to North Park High, which was a Swedish Lutheran uh, private, and then did my last three years at Lakeview High School. Uh, one thing that's uh, of real significance in Lakeview um, is that I had a chance to study under a PhD in mathematics, Dr. Clyde Brown, whom I'll never forget. And the preparation that he, he gave me in mathematics moved me forward throughout the rest of my career and was really helpful in, in the Naval Academy situation. Uh, towards the end of my uh, senior year, um, I was not really sure where I was going to go to school. And I found out that Sid Yates, who was our congressman, offered the opportunity to people in high school to take a competitive examination for an appointment because, you know, appointments are often strictly political. And the congressman or senator can give a principal appointment and can give two um, alternate appointments. But the kicker in all this is you have to still pass the Naval Academy exams in order to be accepted into the school. So anyhow, um, I, I had uh, graduated from school in 1952, and uh, that summer I went ahead and I took the competitive exam. And one of my classmates from high school also took the competitive exam, and he was in the ROTC, and I wanted to go to the academy. And it turned out that I wound up writing the top exam among about 30 young men. So I had the opportunity or the choice to go to the Naval Academy or West Point, so I chose to go to the Naval Academy. Now what motivated that choice? Well, I have, we have no history of military in my family except my great, my great grandfather was in the Civil War and he was also in Chicago, fought the Chicago Fire after the war. My grandmother's brother was in either the Marines or the Army back before World War I. We have pictures of him all over the world, uh, Helgi Anderson. And then my cousin uh, was a chaplain in World War II. Roy, Roy Anderson was his name. And I was reading a lot of books, a lot of books about submarines. And I thought if I went to the academy, you know, um, I was kind of a short guy. Uh, you know, it would be a good chance to be turned into a man and maybe go into the submarines. So I went ahead and, and took the exam and, and, uh, and, and got the appointment. And then I found out that I was short in a couple of courses. So I went to the Illinois Institute of Technology and took an econ course and an algebra course. 
and I met the academic requirement. Then I took an academic examination and we were tested in algebra and geometry and English primarily and some other subjects and I uh, passed that and then I went to Great Lakes Naval Station and I took my physical and I had been worried because I'd broken my leg in the last game of the season in baseball the year before and I was hoping it was going to be healed and it was and my father has flat feet and I, I just had enough arch to pass the <laughs> physical so I passed the physical so then I got a letter um, saying, you know, report to the Naval Academy, and I think the date on that was like the 29th of, uh, the 29th of uh, June, oh, June. Okay. June, 1953. Um, so I climbed in an airplane, which I never had, a commercial airliner, never flown before. I flew into Washington and then from there to Baltimore, and we were late getting in. And this is this is strange. And then uh, so I wound up taking a bus in. So I'm walking down Maryland Avenue in Annapolis at about two o'clock in the morning. And of course it's dark and there's nobody around. And, and uh, found my way to the main gate and said, "Go up to Bancroft Hall." And I did, which is a dorm at the Naval Academy. And there was two guys sitting watch. And they said, uh, I showed them my papers. They said, "Find any room. Everybody else is here already. We don't have any sheets or pillowcases. Just find a room and crash." And a bell will go off in the morning and you show up for breakfast. So the next morning the bell went off and I went down and had breakfast. And of course we had over 1,100 people that started in my class. Um, we only wound up, we lost about 300 over the four years. And then we, we checked in at a place called Dahlgren Hall. And I paid $100, which went into my account, and I was sworn in that afternoon in Memorial Hall on the 29th as a midshipman of the United States Navy. And, uh, but when I, well, I'll never forget, I was standing in line and, uh, to register, and I'm saying to myself, what am I doing here? You know, and I found out a lot of the other guys had the same kind of feeling. Uh, then we went into plebe summer, and plebe summer you were trained in all kinds of uh, military stuff to get us ready to be assimilated into the, the Naval Academy. Uh, they gave us a little book called Reef Points, and you had to memorize about the history of the Navy and, and some of these goofy sayings, and we had to learn all the fight songs, and we had to learn how to spit shine our shoes and dress properly and make our beds and and have your stuff all lined up in your locker and, and all this stuff and learn all the learn that stairs were ladders and walls were bulkheads and fore and aft and top side and below and blah 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 you know uh, who was teaching you all that stuff? Uh, there were uh, seniors uh, not seniors they were second class mm -hmm. because the seniors had already graduated right. the second class were now seniors mm -hmm. And they were, they were running the show, and we also had company officers there, regular Navy and Marine Corps, because people who graduated from the academy could go in the right. Navy or the Marine Corps. Plebeer was uh, really interesting. It was uh, a real challenge. The average academic load at the Naval Academy is 21 hours uh, every semester for eight semesters. Plus, in the summer, you spent two months on cruise where you were also learning and traveling about the academy. Uh, you were expected to be involved in athletics and extracurricular activities besides this. And the competition was fierce. Your grades were posted every week in your area uh, in every class. You took an exam in every class every week. So your class standing was always known by everybody. Uh, and so your standing in the class was not just based on academics, it was also based on your aptitude for the service, which we call grease, and, and other factors. Uh, you, uh, we often got called around, we had to come around to the, to the upperclassmen and recite something or other, memorize something, and you mastered the phrase, I'll find out, sir. You never said, I don't know. And so you were in the library and other places finding out all kinds of information. We had to walk down the centers of the hall, keep our eyes in the boat, which means straight ahead. We had to run up and down the stairs. We had to look sharp. We had to be in formation before anybody else. 
uh, you know, we, uh, we were, and everybody was watching us all the time to try to shape us up. And uh, it started in the summer. And then, of course, when the brigade came back in the fall, we had to be integrated. Uh, we went to all of the football games and stuff like that. And we marched on at the Army-Navy game and everything was, that was really a big deal. Now, how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to that way of life? Uh, it was not hard. It was not hard. I have a lot of self-discipline. Um, I'd always been athletic. I lettered in three sports in high school, and I'd been involved in extracurricular activities. Uh, academics uh, were a piece of cake for me in high school, but I had to work harder here in the university because actually, you know, right now, the acceptance rate at the Naval Academy is equal to the acceptance rate at Harvard. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's stronger academically than West Point is. It's always been that way. Well, I digress. <laughs> Sorry about that. So anyhow, I did adjust, mm -hmm. and uh, I got into the rhythm of it, um, and it worked out fine. Then we went on, on, every summer we did a cruise. The first cruise we did was in 1954, and I was assigned the battleship New Jersey, BB-62. And uh, we cruised out in the, in the Atlantic. Uh, we made one stop in Vigo, Spain, and I got a chance to go to Santiago de Compostela and some other places in Spain. Um, and we stayed ashore at one of the hotels there. And then we went to sea again, and we uh, went to Cherbourg. And, of course, we had a chance to look at uh, the Normandy uh, situation, which was very interesting. And then by rail, we went into Paris and I saw all the major sites. My mother kept all of the letters that I wrote. And I wrote a number of postcards home, and I still have those, and so I can review some of these things. I haven't read through all the, the correspondence that I sent to my mom and dad, but I intend to do that, because I'm sure that will be very, very interesting. Uh, then we sailed on down to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, which is where we did live artillery firing, and I had a chance to see the 16-inch guns fired, which were the biggest in the world at the time. Of course, the Japanese were probably working on things that we didn't know prior to World War II. Uh, yeah, they had know. bigger guns, but they were kind of the bottom of the Pacific by then. Yes, yes. Very interesting what, uh, what they were doing, but of course we were not aware of that. Uh, and when, when we were aboard ship, it's very interesting. I didn't know this, but my boss at Western Michigan University Lowell Crow was in the NROTC, and he was on that ship the same time I was, although I didn't know it. <laughs> so that was kind of an interesting thing to happen. Um, and after that, you know, we returned home. Uh, that was about a 60-day cruise. And at the Naval Academy, when you see the Chapel Dome uh, from the Chesapeake Bay, when you sail home from the cruise, then you are automatically in the next year's class. Mm -hmm. So I became a youngster, which was a, a third-class midshipman. The classes were, you know, fourth class, third class, second right. class, first class. And the, the first year you were called a plebe, the second year you were called a youngster, the third year you were just a, a segundo or something like that, and then there were the firsties. Uh, during my second, uh, my, my second year when I was a uh, midshipman third class, um, the academic load was still the same. By the way, you're taking... We were studying, you know, engineering, we were studying... Um, uh, 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 physics and, and chemistry and mathematics and ordnance and gunnery and uh, history and foreign language. Uh, in those days, everybody took the same courses. So the only uh, course that I had a choice in was foreign language, and I studied Russian for two years. And we were involved in athletics, and uh, I had played on the plead squash team, and I was playing, and I was working for the radio station and uh, doing other things, and we don't have to go into all that. Uh, but it was a really good year. It's a relaxed year. When I was a plebe, I only had Saturday afternoons off in town. But as a second, as a youngster, I had Saturday and then Sunday afternoon, so we had more time free. And of course, he was totally relaxed. Uh, then the cruise that following summer, after my youngster years, uh, is a kind of an aviation familiar familiarization time. I was aboard the Happy Valley. Uh, the USS Valley Forge uh, aircraft carrier, 
and uh, we uh, did not go overseas that time. We did go uh, to, we did, yes, we went to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and we did go to Guantanamo uh, Bay. No, we didn't go to Guantanamo Bay that year. But we did go to Little Creek, Virginia, and we got amphibious training with the Marine Corps, and we actually crawled off the side of a ship down the net into an uh, LCVP and made a, you know, storm the beach at Little Creek. And we also had a chance uh, during that time to go to uh, a couple of the naval aviation facilities that were in that area, Pax River test facility and stuff. Uh, second class year, uh, you're getting more responsibility uh, within the brigade and having more responsibility with, with rank and that sort of thing, although the first class ran the whole show. Uh, also, that was the year where we were introduced to flying. And, uh, we did familiarization in the N3N, which was called the Yellow Peril. This is a, uh, a single center pontoon aircraft, a reciprocating engine, and a couple of pontoons off on the wings. We made landings and takeoffs and did a little flying around uh, right there at the academy because we had our own facility right, right there over the Severn River in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, interesting, they were sort of needle ball and alcohol airplanes. They didn't have any uh, electronics of any, uh, any sort. And um, we had no direct communication except we wore a little mask over our face with a tube where you could talk to the instructor in the back, back seat. So that was really interesting. Now, were you uh, getting some basic flight instruction? Or? Yeah, we actually were learning how to fly, although we didn't solo in the aircraft. So we actually had a chance to take off and land the aircraft and... Uh, you know, and maneuver the aircraft and that sort of stuff. The objective was to sort of let us know about the different uh, types of opportunities. So during the second class cruise, we learned about the Marine Corps and amphibious operations, and then you, you learned about the Black Shoe Navy, the Surface Navy throughout the rest, and then this was the air, the Navy air kind of exposure. And, uh, and then in our senior year, um, that, uh, that cruise between my second class and first class, I was on a destroyer. Uh, destroyer, the Perry, I think was the name of that destroyer. And uh, I was in the, uh, my, my, I stayed in the quarters with the, uh, with the chief petty officers, those, those people up in the bow of the ship. And it took me about three days to get my sea legs. I mean, in the North Atlantic in a destroyer is a ride and a half. And the most interesting time in that was that uh, at night we had to get up and shoot the stars with our sextant. And of course the ship is going like this. Uh, and then determine your position out in the Atlantic because we were working on our navigation. That cruise, uh, we went into Plymouth. I saw HMS Victory, you know, Lord Nelson's great ship. And we went our, made our way to London and did all the sights of London. And then we set sea again uh, and went to Stockholm and toured Stockholm. Uh, and then I found out in my senior year that I was physically capable of flying either Navy or Air Force Air. Um, and I'd had some eye problems prior to that. But so then I found out that 25% of the class could go into the Air Force. I also wanted to get back to graduate school as fast as I could. And the quickest way was to go into the Air Force. And so, since I didn't have any history or tradition in the Navy, uh, I decided to go in the Air Force. I was in the 13th company at the United States Naval Academy, and we won the colors in our senior year, which meant we were the best company in the entire brigade. Um, and that they looked at our academics, they looked at, uh, we were tested in all kinds of naval uh, activities, and they looked at our athletic performance and all this kind of stuff to do that. So that was quite an honor in your senior year to be the color company, which we were. Um, when I uh, chose to go into the Air Force, uh, I uh, opted for pilot training. Now, um, by that time, we had lost, uh, by graduation, 300 of our classmates. They went out on academics. They went out on aptitude for the service. They went out for physical reasons. Some of them self-initiated initiated their elimination. And others went out for violations of the honor code because the honor code was very, very strict there. Uh, just, a, just a moment. Um, my three mo mo uh, roommates at the Naval Academy, Ted Olmsted was the first flag officer in our entire class. He was the first one to make admiral. 
He was about 70th in the class. My other roommate was Bob Johnson. He was fourth in the class, and he's captain of the 150-pound football team and uh, also was uh, just a great guy overall. And he went into the Air Force and got out. And my other roommate, J.P. O'Neill, James Patrick O'Neill, wound up being a crusader pilot and retired as a captain uh, from the Navy. Okay, now back to the Air Force. So um, I'm not referring too much to my notes because I'm surprised how much I remember here. <laughs> so in September of 1957, I reported to Graham Air Base in Mariana, Florida for primary training uh, uh, in uh, flight training. Uh, the first aircraft I flew there was a T-34 uh, Mentor. And uh, it was, uh, I soloed after about eight hours, and I, I can't remember, I think I spent about four weeks in pilot training. Let was me that just, a single engine propeller it's plane? It's a single engine propeller driven airplane. Uh, just, just one second here. I was in the class of 59B. Uh, for that aircraft, and, uh, and then we went into the T-28. Interestingly, the Mentor was about a 300 mile an hour airplane, but then the T-28 Max was about 282, but it was like a World War II, early World War II fighter plane. Great air, acrobatic airplane. Uh, you could do anything with that airplane. And so I completed um, that training, I think, and I was looking at my notes, I think it was sometime in the January, February time frame of 1958. Then I went to Webb Air Force Base in Big Spring, Texas for uh, basic training. And there I flew the T-33A. Now the T-33A was a modification of the F-80 Shooting Star, which was the first you know, effective Air Force uh, fighter jet. In fact, it was used in Korea early on. Um, it was very quiet. I remember that. And now when you were flying, you were pulling more G's. When we do maneuver, we're pulling, you know, four and five G's and more. And I remember uh, significantly the first solo flight. Uh, so you go through ground training and you go through a blindfold cockpit check and you fly with your instructor and then he says, okay, go. So I got in the airplane, I checked everything out, everything was working perfectly and then after takeoff I realized after about 15 or 20 minutes my tip tanks were not feeding. Now on a T-33 you have these gigantic tip tanks, tip tanks out on the wing and I, th I can't remember how many gallons of fuel they carried. But I, I tried to get them, I went through the emergency procedures and couldn't get them feeding. So I called to the tower and they said, okay. They ran me through the procedures again. Then they had me do some maneuvers, you know, pull some G's and do some turning to see if I could get them started. And I couldn't. So they said, you're going to have to drop the tanks. So burn some fuel down because they wouldn't let me land on my first solo flight with the tip tanks full because of the weight. So they lined me up uh, low at low altitude and a certain speed and said, okay, when you get to a point, we'll tell you to push. Well, once you push the button, if only one tank goes off, that's all she wrote. And I pushed the button and both tanks went off, thankfully, and it was an uneventful flight when we came back and, and landed. Okay, now, just to clarify a little bit, you said the tanks, you weren't able to get fuel a lot of the tanks, right. but they... So why would you fly longer if you're not going to get any fuel out of them? You wanted to lower the, 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 the weight of the aircraft. To the hole. Okay. Because I had, I had a tip, I had fuel in the wings, mm -hmm. and fuel in the tank right behind the right. you know, back okay. seat. And so they wanted me to come in as light as possible, because the heavier you are, the more dicey it gets, especially if you're in crosswind or something like that. It, gets to be really, it can be really crazy. I lost a buddy in F-101 so anyhow, uh, they came off, I punched them off, and, and I finished, and I got my uh, wings in uh, September, September 8th, 1958. Because of my class standing, I had the choice of going in the fighter as of going in the bomber, the transporter. Mm -hmm. I chose fighters, and I chose all-weather interceptors. So in 1958, Later in that year, I reported to Moody Air Force Base in Valdosta, Georgia. 
Um, by this time, I think I had made captain. I'm not sure. But I was still first lieutenant. Mm -hmm. uh, so I reported, and uh, we did a lot of ground training, and I did a lot of flying under the hood in the T-33. Under the hood means, you know, they put a hood in the, in the front seat. Uh, you're in the back seat. Mm -hmm. They put a hood over the seat so I can't see outside, and you're only flying on instruments. Right. So the total flight is, is that as soon as you take off, the instructor would take off, then you're on instruments from then on. So you climbed to altitude on instruments and flew your pattern on instruments, made your approaches on instruments, did everything on instruments. Because we were going to be an all-weather interceptor pilot, so I had to make some. So I got through that, and then we uh, started in the F-86. This is the first time I'd flown in a, in, a, in a fighter simulator, and it had all the noises and the engines and stuff, and you sat in the simulated cockpit. And it's for procedural training. And the thing about the F-86 is it's a single-seat plane. There is nobody behind you when you fly. And so I went through it, and we did all the, the safety checks, and we did, uh, and then you do a blindfold cockpit check and check in case you have smoke in the cockpit, so you're blindfolded, and you have to find all of the gears and all of the, all of the, uh, the, uh, the switches and the circuit breakers. You have to know. You just say where is this, and you have to be able to put your hand out. So anyhow, uh, we did that, and then we practiced uh, starting the engines and taxiing them out, and then we. Do a high speed taxi where you get out on the runway and you run down the runway. And we didn't put an afterburner, we just did high speed just with the engine up to 100%, and you go maybe a couple thousand feet and then you pull the power back. And then we pull back in, and then the instructor uh, said, Okay, uh, we're going to go. Okay, and so he got in, in his, his plane, and you were refueled, and you taxied out together, and the instructor's on your wing. So he was on my right wing, and you get out to the end of the runway, and you go through all your checks, and you close the cockpit, and you run the power up to 100%, and you check to make sure you, all the instruments look good. Then I'm the leader now, so you pull the power back to 96%, because the instructor's rolling with you, and he has to have some power to maneuver. So we started rolling down the runway, and then you hit it in the afterburner, which was the most thrilling feeling you could throw back at the seat. And then we, we took off. And we went through a few uh, standard maneuvers, and he's on your wing through all the maneuvers. And then he brings you back, and you do one low approach, which means you go through the entire procedure. You pitch out, and he's on your wing when you pitch out over the end of the one where you roll around and downwind, you drop your gear, you drop your flaps, and you come into land, and he's with you, and then he drops you off the second time you make the landing. So. Your first solo flight is truly, uh, or your first flight is truly a solo mm -hmm. flight. And I never flew with anybody because they're all solo. So that was interesting. You had a lot, of, a lot of confidence in yourself. And of course, by that time, I had a lot of flying time. But it was a little, you know, a little worrisome when you first time going. Now, as you go through these different stages of, of, of flight training now, uh, what proportion of the people that you start with are, are there at the end of each stage? That would be hard for me to say, but I would think in probably in primary, we might have lost 10% uh, in, in, uh, in basic when we got to the T-Bird. I think we lost at least another 10%. Um, in fact, I had a couple of friends killed. Was at a table with a guy in the morning, we we're being briefed, and uh, I never saw him. Mm -hmm. And he went out the T 33 on a solo flight, and he, uh, he wound up in a hole in the ground. He was doing unauthorized two old altitude acrobatics. Now, were there people who couldn't handle the higher G's of the jets and that kind of thing, or had they screened for that already? Uh, no, you were screened for that because, you know, we, were, we, were, we had a chance to go into the the old machine, mm -hmm. like the centrifuge, we were in centrifuge to make check. And you were also taken to altitude and altitude changers to make sure you can handle that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but there were people who physically went out, and some guys just pulled the cork. But I don't remember the exact number. But it got tougher the farther along 
we got. But then also you started getting more competent people. And then I got into the 86s. Uh, we had people who were the violence mm -hmm. start. So anyhow, I completed that. And uh, then in the meantime, I had applied uh, to the Air Force Institute of Technology and went to the University of Michigan to go into astronautics. And I was accepted at the University of Mich in Michigan to start in 1961. So I started in pilot training here in the F-86 in 58. And I completed that in 59. And because of that I had done well enough uh, in the program, and because I had been accepted at the University of Michigan, they didn't want me to go to an active air defense unit. So they kept me on as an instructor pilot. So I checked out as an instructor pilot T-33s and as an instructor pilot F-86s. And then what I had gone through, now I had a suit assigned to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was giving them all the instruction, flying with them, and flying formation with them in all their flights. And on one of them, uh, one of the flights, and this is my first student, and uh, we were doing aerobatics. And, and you hang on, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're doing a loop and he's doing the loop and you're with him on his wing, and if he's doing the roll and then you're with him on his wing, and if he's doing an implement or something else, you're on his wing all the time. Well, we got up to the top, uh, just up at the top of the loop, and I, and I flamed out. So my engine quit. And you only have one engine. <laughs> uh, so I rolled out and I told him, you know, just, uh, uh, and then I called into the base and told him, that I'd lost an engine, and I was sending him back. And I went through the uh, emergency procedures, and, and I got lit. So I was very fortunate. And you have to have it lit by 10,000 to be able to bail out. And I was already <clears throat> also trying to find a place where I could put it down, but I'd lost all my hydraulics. Uh, but also, you have a little uh, fan sort of thing that you can drop down into the windstream, you know, that might get the premium enough to get your gear. But I was just thankful I got a start. I did and made it back. But things went very well and I really enjoyed that. The type of weapon system we had were just 24 2.75 inch mighty mouse rockets. You acquired the target on your radar screen and you got a die on the screen and uh, uh, and when you locked on, uh, you know, you'd say, I got a Judy, you'd say, Judy, and, and, and then you, the aircraft basically uh, gave you the signals, and you increase your speed to attack speed, and then the dot would go up, and you flew up, up towards the target, and then you'd get a fire signal when you went to launch the rockets. Of course, we didn't launch any rockets at that time, but because I was also an instructor, I had to sit alert. So now, because I was qualified, you know, I was I was set out with another guy in the, in the alert ship, and I sat out alert probably half a dozen times. I was only scrambled once, and naturally it's two o'clock in the morning. You're sound asleep, you know. You come out, and they've already got the engine started, and you're putting on your gear, jumping the airplane, and and, the, and you taxi out, and you're going through your checks and the canopy down, and you get to the end of the runway, and and I was going off by myself. You know, we weren't going off in formation. And you start running down, and it's pitch black, and you're still half asleep. You hit the afterburner, and bam, you start going up. And, and then you get vectored in. You have someone on the ground. It was a B-52. It, it was a test. And they found him, and they gave me a heading, and I picked him up on the radar. I said, contact, and then I got him, and I said, Judy, you know, and then I went out and, uh, and went, went through the procedure. And, uh, it, was, it was just a test. Mm -hmm. Um, then um, the base was being sh shut down for, uh, for fighters, and they were moving them. They were going to transition F-102s at Perrin Air Force Base out west. And I can't remember where Perrin is. I think maybe it's in Arizona. And, of course, they weren't going to have me do that. In the meantime, I had been at Graham Air Base, okay? That's where I learned how to fly. Well, they moved the whole primary training unit. To, to Moody, and they said, okay, you're going to be an instructor pilot there. So I went back to teaching T-34 and T-28 pilots mm -hmm. for people to fly, and they were foreign students, and one, uh, two or three were from Vietnam, and, mm -hmm. I, and one of them later became a Indian. So then I left for, uh, after I did that, uh, I 
think that was the 3550th was the unit, but I'm not sure for the Air Training Command. Uh, then I left and went to the University of Michigan. I reported to the University of Michigan. I started school in June of 1961 in the astronautics program, which was astronautical and aeronautical engineering. Uh, I kept up my flying by flying out of Selfridge in T-33s so I could keep, keep my flight plating and keep my currency, a general currency. The class was very unusual. There was only about a dozen of us, and they were all West Point and Annapolis graduates. And they were all, uh, they were not all pilots, but most of them were. And one of them, Al Warden, was a good friend of mine, and I studied with him. He wound up working on the development of the command module, and actually Captain the command of the right. command module around the moon in orbit. Um, I completed that program in 1963. One of the problems I had with them is I was having to take the same math I needed for some of the courses that I was taking at the master's level of engineering. And so initially I cut back on my load and then I reworked it out you know, so I could finish on time. And so I graduated in 1963. I then was given an assignment to the Air Force Rocket Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, and I was a captain, as I said by that time, as a uh, test project officer. We were developing uh, all kinds of liquid and solid rocket propellant engines uh, to be used in weapon systems, but also right outside my window on the Mesa, I would say about a mile away, they were testing the F-1. And the F-1 is about 1.5 million pound thrust engine. A cluster, I think, of four of those was used on the Apollo. That was the booster for the mm -hmm. Apollo missions to the moon. And when that went off, well, it shook it in place. Uh, I was managing contracts with Ling Temco Vaught, with Thiokol. I was working with uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in there uh, with their propulsion group. Uh, and then uh, one of my tasks was contact all of the services to try to forecast their needs for rocket propulsion into the near future. And so I had a chance to, to do that kind of work. Um, while I was there, uh, uh, I had a, a very interesting thing happen. I got a call from a buddy who said, you've got to go down to the runway tonight at dusk. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, I can't tell you. Go down there. So I went down there, and of course I could get in all the way to the runway. And this strange craft pulls up, and it's SR-71 Blackbird. The most incredible looking, long, low, sleek airplane with these two big engines, totally black. It pulls up on the runway, and I didn't know what the heck it was. And he started rolling, and he hit those afterburners, and just flew down that runway, and went almost straight up, and he was out of sight. Snow time. And those planes, you know, they fly over 80,000, greater than Mach 3.2 or more. Well, they've been testing them right there at Edwards, mm -hmm. and I didn't even know. And of course, they were being made by Lock Lockheed, and the Skunk Works of Lockheed is right there on the Sahara Dead, and not the Mojave Dead, yeah. which is where Edwards is. In the meantime, I had also contacted the flight test school to try to see if I could get into flight test school, and they even looked at all my records, and they said, You're totally qualified but you don't have any century series time. I hadn't flown 100s, 101s, 102s, 104s, 106s. So I did one of them there. In 1964, I could see that I had, I really would have to go to Vietnam, so I volunteered to go to Vietnam. Well, what were you aware of at that point regarding the situation in Vietnam? That it was sort of like a police action over there. It wasn't like a full-blown war. You know, what people don't know is, is uh, I think even uh, Kennedy had sent some guys over there as advisors, I think T using like T-28s, or maybe they were even using A-1s. There were people over there in, in the 60s early, mm -hmm. before people knew what was going on, you know. <laughs> so there was stuff over there. But I could see, uh, I, my, my effectiveness reports have been way off the charts. Mm -hmm. I've been moving really fast, and it looked like that I was on the way for a career, and I figured if I'm going to do that, I have to go. So I volunteered in 1964, and I found out pretty quickly that they would take me in. 
and I was I was hoping that I'd get a fighter slot, you know, and wind up over there in you know one hundred fives or one hundreds or something like that. Uh, and I got an assignment to fly A ones, which would have been great. That's a fighter bomber, you know, a, a great airplane, a prop driven airplane, and and that would be with the Vietnamese Air Force. So I thought well, that's cool. Uh, but then very quickly they changed my orders because I'm like, so I Johnson decided to send 500,000 troops to Vietnam in 1965 and so that that man with all these troops on the ground you're gonna you're gonna need a ton of uh, a greater number of foreign air controllers now the Vietnamese have been doing this for a long time so they changed my orders and needless to say, uh, I was not a happy camper. To come from a 700 mile an hour F-86 down to a T-20, to uh, something better than a T-28, the A-1 would have been fine. But now to go to an O-1, which is cruising at, you know, 90 to 95 knots, which is 100 miles an hour, and I was not just, a just describe the, the O-1 for the benefit of the outside the audience. The O-1 is a single engine, a light combing engine, uh, a uh, low horsepower airplane. It's a high a high wing monoplane. Um, I had been flying tricycle landing gear, which means a nose gear and, and two gear under the wing. And this had a tail wheel uh, and plus regular landing gear. It's a typical, you know, first small airplane for a lot of private uh, flyers. Uh, the two seater, uh, tandem seat, somebody in the back, and you. The seats are very primitive. They're just like uh, like pipe, you know, and, and uh, canvas seats, uh, and uh, not very sophisticated uh, avionics. Hardly any avionics or even instruments. So it's uh, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I really learned how to fly. Uh, because you had to be able to handle all kinds of weather conditions and wind and crosswind uh, and to get this airplane on the ground uh, in some cases was no mean feat. And it was very light so you were like a big sail in the airplane. Okay. And did you find out you had that assignment before you actually went over? Yes. Okay. As soon as I got that assignment I had, I had started into the routine. And the first thing I went was what we call SEER training, S-E-R-E. -E. It's uh, survival, escape, reconnaissance, what, something in evasion. Uh, I can't remember what the S-E-R-E -E is. I can, but just give me one second. This will just want take one second. Because I've had that described a couple of times by people I've interviewed, and it's a... Uh interesting process. Survival training and it, it, it was in Spokane, Washington at Fairchild Air Force Base. Survival, evasion, resistance and escape. So we first, uh, now what's interesting about this is, uh, this is not a self-aggrandizing statement, I was an Eagle Scout and a Scout Master and a Cub Master. I had a ton of experience in camping, in hiking, orienteering, and being out in the wilderness was no big deal. Okay, and it was for most everybody that was in the group, and these are all pilots that were in the group. So we got training in, in, in all these techniques, you know, uh, and then we uh, were taken uh, out. Uh, we, we had a chance to make a, uh, a, uh, a sleeping bag out of a parachute and we all we had was we had in our survival kit. We turned that into a pack. We had about 900 calories a day and, and minimum water supply uh, to, and, and we were paired up. And you could only travel at night and you were in territory that you'd never been in before and you had typographical maps uh, and you paired up with one other person. You could, as I said, you traveled only at night, which made it even more difficult in the navigation. And then during the daytime, you had to be hidden. You had to find some place, and you hold up all day, and you couldn't move because they were out looking for you. Um, after we hit the the first checkpoint or the second checkpoint, um, my partner was really having a hard time, uh, and, and keeping up was part of his problem. But they said, we're going to switch your partner on. I said, you can't do that 
because switching out a partner is not realistic. Because if I go down with somebody, that's your partner, and you work together. And they finally said, I'm sorry, sir, we're going to remove this man and give you another partner. And I said, OK, but I don't think it's fair. And I don't think it's realistic. So they swapped out my partner. And we were able to make all our checkpoints. And then when you made the last checkpoint, you're absolutely exhausted. And you had to crawl, either on your hands, your knees, and under your belly, and sometimes under barbed wire. And part of it, they were fire, firing ammunition over. So you're already exhausted, and then you, and it was, I don't remember how long it was, but it seemed like miles. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure it was just a matter of maybe two or three hundred yards or something like that. And then they took you into solitary confinement. And you're in these places that you can't, you can stand up, you can sit down, but you can't lay out. It's a cement floor. I'd say it's probably no more than four feet by four feet would be my guess. And there's a honey bucket there if you have to relieve yourself. They're constantly having uh, recordings of babies crying and uh, Chinese music. And every few minutes they knock on the door and you had to respond to keep you awake. And I don't know how long I was in there, but it was probably just a matter of maybe 12 or 18 hours. I don't know. And then they bring you in for interrogation. And then you'd go in and they'd interrogate you. And we had been given information in advance that we were not, we were not supposed to reveal, you know, its name, rank, and serial number. You're sitting on three-legged stools or two-legged stools. You're sitting against the wall. And, and physically and mentally, it's very, very stressful. And this, this came out of Korea. That's why we did this. And then they put me in a box, <clears throat> head first in a box. And it was about a little bit more than my shoulder width and about on your hands and knees, OK, head first. So it was long enough for me to get in there. And they close up the back and they lock the back. It's pitch dark. And you can imagine this would be a claustrophobic nightmare for some people. Well, I was uh, solving math problems. I was writing music. I was uh, recalling memories. I was, I totally zoned out of where I was. You could not think about where you were. And I don't know how long it was in there. Uh, and, uh, but I was able to zone on that. Some of my buddies would put in big barrels in lukewarm water with enough uh, clearance that the touch your head could be above, and they put the top down. And you have a sense of disorientation when you're in lukewarm water, totally immersed, you know. And I, I wasn't given that. And I, I did fine, actually. I think the interrogation went well, and I put up with it OK. And I'm, and I, but I was in really good physical condition. Then they put us in a prison camp. And now we're all together for the first time. And so they said, you know, if you can get out, you got to work together to try to get out. And so we worked as, in groups, and, uh, and uh, we got one of our buddies out. And, uh, and then I said, I'd like to try to get out. If, if you didn't make it, you wound up back in solitary, back in the, in the, in the process, you know. So we made a plan, and they caused a big ruckus. And I crept around and got in the shadows and, and, and went and watched the guards as they were going. And I made it under the fence. And I hustled back. And I didn't know exactly where the camp, the headquarters and stuff were. But I kind of worked my way back. And I just showed up and said, you know, Captain Lincoln's reporting for duty, sir. <laughs> and. Uh, and then they said, fine, you're released, and you meet us at a certain time. And of course, I, I think I immediately went and had a hamburger and a shake or something like that. I didn't lose any weight, which is really kind of amazing. Some of the guys lost 20 pounds. And we were only out there in the mountains for maybe five days and, and maybe a total of two or three days in the prison camp and the other stuff. Okay, and then uh, I uh, was sent to Maxwell Air Force Base, uh, Alabama, uh, for uh, uh, aircrew familiarization and to learn about uh, this kind of warfare. And so I flew out of Hurlbut Bird, Bird Field. I only did 133 landings. I only had nine uh, hours of flying time in the 01 to learn the tactics, and I was done. I couldn't believe this. That was all the total of my flight training. I think it was nine hours, just 
Let me make a quick uh, check. You've been through all of these different. No, 24 training. hours of flight. 24 hours. Yeah, of all flight. these different training programs and so forth. I mean, flight training is a very, very, very long process. Yeah. The pilot training. So I guess you've done all of those courses, and then this one. This one was. I was amazed. It was actually was 24 hours. I see that. Mm -hmm. 24 hours. And, and it was only a matter of how many days. I was there from the 30th of August to the 7th of September in flight team. So what's that, eight days, nine days, whatever. Yeah. That was it. So, so and I got some special air warfare training, you know, so there was a lot of ground training and about, and about four air control training and stuff like that. And then they sent me to Washington, D.C. for counterinsurgency training. And there I learned more about what our tactics were at the current time. Uh, I was, I was uh, exposed to Vietnamese culture, history, a little bit of the language. Um, and that was the end of my training. Um, and that was done sometime in like October and then November. What was, what was the key date in November? On 9 November 1965. I left for Vietnam. Um, I went to Traverse Air Force Base. I think I, within a day or so I left Traverse. And in those days, uh, Pan American Airline, regular Pan American aircraft, was just loaded with GIs. You know, they were contracted. I think we stopped in Narita and refueled and then uh, flew to Tan Sanut in, in Saigon, which is now Ho Chi Minh City. And what's your first impression of Vietnam when you get there? Okay. The first thing was when I opened up the door of the aircraft, I was like, I was right in the front for some reason, the first row of seats. I stepped on the, uh, the, uh, the, Latin, the, the platform to go down the stairs, and I felt like I stepped into the ocean. The humidity was incredible. I'd never experienced that. I uh, went down the ramp. Uh, they bust us downtown to a hotel and I felt like I was I had never known what poverty was uh, it was it was dirty uh, the people were alongside the streets and they were huddled and the markets were just you know open open air markets um, looking really really primitive and I've been to some other countries uh, backward not backward third world countries and I've seen somewhere later um, and the road's not in really good shape, even to downtown. And we wound up in the hotel, and I think the hotel is still there, but I don't know the name. I tried to find it on the web, but I couldn't match it up. Uh, we were put it, put up in the hotel, um, I think, for just one night. I was, you know, I shared a room with somebody. I don't remember who it was. We, I remember having dinner there. We went into the bar. The bar was up on the fourth or fifth floor, and there was a balcony, and you could look out over the city. I said, how do I get up to my base? I was going to Da Nang. He said, you're going to have to hitch a ride. Just go on down to the, to the Air Force facility on Tan Sanut. And I hitched a ride, and I wound up up near the DMZ in a 130. I couldn't get a flight directly to Da Nang. And the conditions were such that they, we, we, when we landed, he, uh, he dropped the ramp in the back and slowed down to a slow taxi, and we had to jump off a moving ramp with our gear and jump into the trenches, which were alongside the runway. And he immediately then turned around and took off because they were within artillery range of, of, uh, of the north, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they would come under mortar attack. I think that was probably the biggest problem, mortar attack. So this is north of Way. But it was in that area, and I don't remember what the airstrip was called. Then I was able to hitch a ride back down to Da Nang, and I think that might have been on a 123 that came in. Oh, shaky. Those planes were unbelievable. You know, twin boom with the pod in the middle. And when I got there, uh, I reported uh, to the 110th uh, Vietnamese uh, liaison squadron as an advisor. I'd been assigned to, to Air Force Advisory Team 7, uh, which was part of an Air Force unit. And actually, the Air Force unit, we were the Detachment 10 of the 1131st U.S. Air Force Special Activity Squadron. That's the official place where we were. Uh, my boss there at the unit 
where they flew O-1s and they flew U-17s. U-17 was a Cessna 172, and that was their support plane. It was a tailwheel, single-engine, reciprocating plane. And uh, I was assigned to work um, as a squadron training officer, as the advisor to the Vietnamese squadron training officer, whose name I cannot remember, but who I had taught how to fly at Moody Air Force Base back in 1960 or 61. Strange, and he was so glad to see me and, and I to see him, and we had quite a friendship. Um, and of course, they called me Dai Wei Lindquist, D A I U Y is captain mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in the Vietnamese uh, Army and Air Force uh, services. I was responsible to develop uh, the tactics for flying uh, forward air control, uh, the combat. Uh, for the training of the new pilots uh, and the observers. Uh, I had to test flight the aircraft when they came out of maintenance. Um, I had to, uh, I've had to fly all the various combat missions, and those missions included a reconna reconnaissance a troop or, or convoy, boy escort, uh, bringing in artillery on the target, bringing in uh, fighter bombers on the target, general reconnaissance. I flew back into to places where you couldn't get back in to drop off orders or information to commanders, maybe on the top of a hill or something like that, in a little can with a streamer. Uh, and, and then I flew support missions where I was taking parts or I was taking personnel. I flew some generals around the Corps and some other high-ranking officers, some of them Vietnamese. Uh, and so I was doing all that, that sort of activity while, while I was there. A few things that uh, I think we have to know about flying. Let's, talk, let's first of all talk about flying in Vietnam. Um, I was now flying at 1,500 feet and 90 to 95 knots. But you had to maneuver all the time. You had to be changing altitude about that and changing direction because you didn't want to be predictable because they could, you, they could hit you with, a, with small arms fire from the ground, particularly a rifle or something like that. You had to learn the territory like the back of your hand because you couldn't use radio, radio navigation. It could be jammed, obviously, but we didn't have much in the airplane anyhow. And so I had to learn uh, the, the territories, the landmarks, the rivers. Uh, we were along the South China Sea, uh, Marble Mountain, and all it. So I could basically fly by the back of my hand. So the first month or so I devoted to that because I often could get caught out. It would start raining. We flew in a lot of crappy weather, and I had to be able to work my way back. And, of course, you didn't fly any of the roads. That would be stupid because they'd be waiting for you on the roads. Um, so that was one thing that, that we had to be aware of. I flew over rice fields, I flew over open fields, I flew over jungles that the canopies were like three levels and if I were to go down they'd never find you. Um, and I, uh, you know, flew over some water uh, when, I, when I was there. So primarily I was flying by dead reckoning, by using uh, the, uh, the I, I had needle ball and alcohol kind of instruments, very primitive instruments in the airplane, but I did have radio uh, for communication if, need, if necessary. Um, I did a lot, I brought in a lot of fighters and, uh, and artillery on targets and I had a Vietnamese in the back seat because we were using Vietnamese fighter planes and artillery and so I would tell him and then he would relay in Vietnamese what the order was, what the command was uh, to the people that were going to be attacking the target. At first, you know, I just opened the window and I pulled the, the, pulled the, the pin and threw out smoke cans, smoke grenades. And you drop them not on the target because it was too dangerous, but maybe, you know, 500, 200 meters away or something like that. And then you'd tell them, you know, 200 meters to the north or 500 meters south or where they were to bring in the, the fire against the target. I got a little sick of that. I thought it was kind of primitive. And I noticed that the Air Force fire fort air controllers had rocket launchers under their old ones. So I went over to the maintenance guys and I said, could you put some rocket launchers on some of our planes? So they equipped two or three of them, I can't remember, and they put 2.75-inch rocket launchers under the wings, under, under the wings of the O-1, 
and they each had two on each side so I could carry three smoke rockets and I, and I carried one regular rocket. And they also did the wiring for us on the airplane so that you'd have, you know, controls of firing uh, trigger in order to launch. And so now I could uh, launch in, on, yeah, but I didn't have any sight. So what do you do for a sight? So the guys in the Air Force, they said, what you do is you take a grease pencil and you level the aircraft. At 90 knots, you take a grease pencil on the horizons and straighten level fight and you run it across the canopy and the spar in the middle and where they intersect, the spar and that, well, that's your, that's your, uh, your crosshairs. And you just roll in on the target and you line it up and shoot, you know, from 1,500 feet or less. So that's what I did. <laughs> so that was my sight. Interesting. I did shoot 2.75 inch, inch regular rockets at VC a couple of times. And I don't know what the. It made me feel good, but I don't think I did any damage. Now, when you were the units on the ground that you were supporting, were they normally Vietnamese? Or were they were they... Vietnamese. They were all Vietnamese. I was not working with any uh, any Air Force or Marine. Okay. People. Now, do you know if that was a Vietnamese First Division, which was kind of based in that area? Or... Well, I was primarily in I Corps. Yeah. So that, I, but I don't know what division okay. that was. But I, that, I flew in all in and out of all of the bases uh, that are the main bases in I Corps. You know, Quang Tri, uh, Quang Ngai. Uh, I flew into Wei, Wei Phu Bai, of course, Da Nang. Um, and some small places. In fact, when I was training these pilots, they had to learn how to, to fly in short field, and we'd go out some places and just on a PSP field. You remember PSP from World War II, those big strips of metal with the holes in, they laid down for the runways? Right. Well, that's what we did. Then you'd hear this pop, 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 and you knew that they, they were coming after you, so then you'd have to get out of there. And of course, I'm in the back seat, they're in the front seat, and you can't see, well, it's a very interesting time. Um, so that's, that's pretty much about the flying uh, itself. Uh, also, um, one of the most difficult places to go in was up in Wei. You had to go in, uh, into the Royal Palace. And so you had to go over a 12-foot wall and drop down immediately on a PSP. And if it's, uh, the weather was good, uh, the winds were gusty or something, it was really difficult to get in there over the wall and kick the plane straight. And then you had to drop it and then stop it. And then, of course, going out, you had the same thing, right? You got at the end of the runway and put the airplane to full power, and then you had to get it and make it out over the wall at the other, at the other end on takeoff. So that was kind of interesting. Um, while I was in, in Vietnam, I also, uh, I'm a musician, and I had been writing music for a number of years, and I, I uh, went into the officers club, the advisory club, and the NCO clubs, and I was singing music and raising funds uh, for orphans, uh, the Vietnamese orphans, and I raised, uh, I don't know, four to five hundred dollars or something like that uh, while I was over there doing that. I also taught some of the pilots' uh, wives uh, English uh, while I was there. Uh, interestingly enough, I decided that I thought I wanted, to, that I did want to go to medical school, so I was in and here I am in Vietnam, right, and I'm studying for the MCATs, I'm teaching myself uh, uh, you know, organic chemistry and other sorts of things and reviewing my math. And I actually flew to Manila and took the MCATs. And before I had left for Vietnam, I had contacted the University of Michigan because I thought I could be a flight surgeon. And they said, well, you know, take the MCATs and we'll see. And actually, when I, when I was over there, I was offered a slot at both the University of Michigan and at Wayne State in the medical school. But that didn't work out with the Air Force. So I digress. I'm sorry. But I was doing other things. The thing about being a pilot over there is I really have a lot of respect for the guys who are on the ground. They're slogging through the mud. They're stepping on mines and on punji stakes. They're seeing people being killed around them. They're in a constant state of anxiety and, and, and terror. Uh, they're not getting a lot of sleep. Uh, it, and they don't know what's around the next bend. I mean, I, those are the guys in Vietnam who were, those are the guys that are really fighting the war. I mean, I was above it. I was being shot at. I was in some really dangerous situations. But I, it, it's nothing compared to the, to the guys on the ground. You know, my hats are off to those people. Okay, so... 
I guess I had to throw that in. I did spend uh, some R&R &R time in Bangkok. I did a weekend. I had five days uh, of R&R &R in Hong Kong at a hotel. They wound up to be at a hotel where all the BOAC air crews were, so that was interesting inter interacting with them. Um, what else do I want to well, talk say? About, talk about the Vietnamese pilots that you worked with. The Vietnamese pilots were outstanding especially the A-1 pilots. They had been doing this for years. By the way, the best pilots in the United States are the Air Guard pilots. And the best maintenance is Air Guard maintenance because these guys are flying all the time for years and they have maintenance people who have been maintenance there for 20 years. The pilots were outstanding. And even the O-1 pilots that have been at it for a while were really good. And the observers, the guys in the back seat, were really good. They had been doing this day after day after day uh, for years. Um, so they were good. And I was flying seven days a week. I averaged uh, maybe two hours a day in the air. Uh, some days I would fly two four-hour missions. Um, I flew um, between 475 and 500 uh, combat sorties uh, while I was in Vietnam. I flew over 400 combat support sorties uh, when I was over there. I was lucky enough to, to earn a D a Distinguished Flying Cross, Cross, 19 Air Medals, Bronze Star, some medals from the, the Vietnamese uh, Air Force, and they gave me Vietnamese wings. Uh, what did they give you the Flying Cross for? They, they gave me the, the, the Distinguished Flying Cross. There, were, there was a, a, a Vietnamese Army unit that was pinned down. They were surrounded by the VC, and there was no way for them, them to get out. And uh, I was up with an observer, and they sent the observer and I in, and they scrambled some fighters to bring them in on the target. Well, I got over there, and of course, they're surrounded, which means, and I'm going to try to mark where, where they have to go in. So I'm marking in, and we're under fire. Thank heavens we didn't catch, we didn't catch any fire in the aircraft itself because I'm maneuvering around. And so I marked the target, and, uh, and then they brought some fighters in once, and then uh, we had to mark it again and bring them, bring them back in again. And, and, the, and then some reinforcements were able to come up, and they were able to, to break out. And basically, uh, they figured I hung around... Uh, almost too long, <laughs> and the Vietnamese observer also was given some award, but the DFC came from the Air Force, mm -hmm. because I was recommended by my boss, uh, because they'd gotten the story from the people on the ground and, and the others that put together, because I, I had no idea, and all of a sudden they said, you realize you're being put in for a DFC, and I said, like, what did I do, <laughs> you know? So it didn't seem that much different to you from stuff you'd done otherwise? No, no. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it was more hairy than most of the situations I was in, obviously. But, you know, the thing about it is, whether you want to do or whether you want to go, you go. I've seen F-4 pilots come uh, at, at night, go out and climb into that airport, into the aircraft to go north, you know. Uh, and and, and they, they just go, and we, were, we lost a lot of planes over there. We lost a lot of 105s, a lot of F-4s, a lot of F-101 reconnaissance planes and others. But I'm kind of getting off the, off the subject a little bit. But fundamentally, um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a good, it was a good tour. I'm really glad that I went. I mean, uh, later when you look back, you don't know... What, what the total outcome was, and I'm sorry we lost so many lives. But when I came home, uh, I was told not to wear my uniform. And people looked down their nose at me because I'd been in Vietnam. You know, I was a baby killer or something like this that. This is only 66 really at this crazy. point, too, isn't it? Pardon? This is only like 66, 67 at that point, yeah, too. Yeah, right? well, I got back in 66, right. Yeah. And this is when, you know, we, we didn't pull out, what was it, 72 or 73? Yeah, the last troops got 73. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And actually, when I was uh, in Da Nang, I was staying downtown. I was in a hotel downtown or an apartment building, three-story apartment building. I shared it with an Army advisor whom I never saw in the entire time. He was out in the field, and I was there. And I got deathly sick uh, about a month after I got there, and I was holed up 
and I used to drive back and forth in the Jeep in my flying gear and all this kind of stuff, and there was no problem. And it was right along the back of the apartment. It was right along the Han River. I could see the river out the back. And um, I got deathly sick, and I had sea rations there, and so I couldn't get out to the base. And then there was an attempted coup to overthrow the president in late 66. And so I'm hearing the tanks, on, I can hear them out on the street, and I was back so I couldn't see the front of the place, and I could hear cannon fire and small arms fire, and actually when I went back to the base, I could see all these pockmarks in the government buildings and stuff like that, you know, from, from the gunfire. And there were uh, armored personnel carriers parked along the streets when I went back to the base. But I finally dragged myself back, I must have been there at, le at least a week. It might have been 10 days and living on sea rations and sicker than a dog and, and you, know, I, you know, I was just going both ends, you know. Um, but that was, that was uh, really a shocker, but after that, that I was fine. I did lose 20 pounds in Vietnam. When I came back and I was almost uh, a little sh uh, yellow and, uh, and I, in Hong Kong I had ordered a suit made and some other stuff and when I got home after about a month or so I couldn't wear it anymore because I put some weight back on. Okay, so after Vietnam, what do they do? Uh, do you have any more questions about Vietnam? Uh, let's see, did you have much interaction with the civilian population there? N uh, none. Uh, only, only, with, only with the military. There was a woman that cleaned my room for 300p a month, I remember, which was nothing. And I said, well, can't we pay them more? And they said, no, you, it's not good for the economy for you guys to be paying them more. And I never hardly ever saw her, but she cleaned my room, she did all my laundry, I just take care, took care of everything, did any mending that I needed. We had to keep our clothes, of course, in an armoire in the room uh, with light bulbs on because of the humidity it would rot your clothes. In fact, they had a real problem with that out in the field right now. Uh, but I, I, I had no interaction with any of the civilian population, other than the wives of the pilots whom, right. whom I met with teaching Vietnamese. Um, one strange story, I did, uh, I lost an engine, I was, uh, and I was at 15, about 1,500 feet, and it just stopped running. Uh, so I went through, and I'm by myself. So and I'm looking for a place to put it down. And I'm out there just in open field, you know, so I could have put it down. And so I'm setting up for that. And I went through the emergency procedures, and I finally found out that one. Again, I had a fuel tank problem, and uh, I found out that one of the tanks wasn't feeding properly. And I was able to switch, and and then I went through the procedures, and I got the engine started. But I don't know, it was a, a couple of hundred feet. I was ready to put it in. I finally got it started. And I called my mom from Hong Kong. This is really strange. And she woke up in the middle of the night one day, 2 o'clock in the morning or sometime, and she said, has something happened to you on such and such a day? Oh, I'm sorry. And I said, I told her. And she, I don't know how. But she had something that told her. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, that's, Sorry. That's okay. I mean, I have heard her. It was that amazing. Kind of thing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing that, that, that it happened. So, anyhow. Yeah, you get it with twins sometimes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, you've. So, I, I, I'm completing my tour, and uh, within three days of my last flight in Vietnam, I was on a plane from Tonsonut back to the States. And again, it was another regular uh, civilian. Mm -hmm. And this is really bad. In World War II, they got on a ship, and it, sometimes it was four or six weeks before they were home. And they had a chance to decompress. Our kids never had a chance to decompress. They put them on a plane, they've been out in the jungle, their time was up, they put them on a plane, they sent them home, three or four days later, they're home, and they're in a supermarket. You know, and I think I saw a scene like that in the movie, and I'm thinking, how did they do that? And that's why we, and my, my son-in-law works with PTSD people for the veterans, mm -hmm. at the Veterans Administration, he's a therapist. Okay, so I get home, and then I'm assigned to the Air Force uh, Air Defense Weapons Center. We're okay. Sorry, I'm checking my time. And I become the, uh, the test branch 
officer for the 14th Air Force. And I have 14, 14 engineers, 14th Air Force, 14 engineers working for me, aeronautical and astronautical engineers, mostly aeronautical engineers, very few of them pilots. And so uh, I'm responsible for uh, development of new missile systems for, well, like we were working on canopy design for the F-102 and 106. We were working on fault detection systems, uh, electronic ways that they use on cars now to figure what's wrong with your car. That was top secret back in those days. And they were doing on fighter airplanes to diagnose what was going on in the avionics. Uh, we were working on uh, fire control systems. Uh, and uh, all, all things associated with the development and testing of air defense weapon systems. Uh, and my job was to manage these people. I wasn't doing any projects myself. I fundamentally watched over those projects, uh, passed on new ideas. I worked directly with uh, the commander of the test center and, and was like the spokesperson for the branch, keeping them up to date on what was going on and handling all that sort of stuff. Uh, I also checked out as uh, a uh, tow pilot in T-33, so I was towing targets for them because we had a firing range out over uh, in the Gulf of Mexico there. In fact, uh, air defense units would come down every year and they would fire down on the range, you know, to stay current. Um, and then, um, uh, you, so you, you take off with this thing uh, hanging under your wing and then you reel it out, you know, and then and then they'd shoot at it, or they might not even be shooting live ammunition. They might just be using it to test uh, uh, acquisition systems, radar systems, and missile test systems, and that sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, while I was there, uh, I approached the Air Force uh, about um, going back to grad school. And to get a PhD, uh, in business administration because we had uh, the ballistic uh, missiles division and other big weapon systems division and you had engineers uh, there and you had uh, business people but you didn't have people that were cross trained mm -hmm. and I could see great potential in having someone that could, to manage because these are multi-billion dollar programs that could understand the technical side of the whole thing which I had learned in my astronautics master's degree because I was you know, I was studying orbital mechanics, and I was studying uh, rocket propulsion, and, and all kinds of other propulsion systems, and the, the math of orbital transfer, and all, you know, I had all that background, you know. Uh, and so I applied for that. Now, in the meantime, um, I asked to get checked out in the F-101B which was the, the air defense, and they had an air defense unit there too, and I thought, well, you know, I can get current in this, and I can go on alert there while I'm doing this, and maybe be able to do, kill two birds with one stone. So I started into pilot training in the F-101, all-weather interceptor, and of course we were carrying the Genie rocket, which is a nuclear rocket for air-to-air -air at the time, and so I was, I learned uh, how to fly the aircraft, it was just a transition time because I had all that 86 time and mm -hmm. I had all that radar time in the 86, so I knew about target acquisition and flying the dot and all that stuff, you know, and I just had to get used to the airplane, it was a much bigger cockpit, and in this case I had two engines and uh, afterburners, and you know, at a top speed of 1,221 miles an hour, and the fastest thing, thing I'd ever flown before was about 700. So uh, I got into that, and uh, and I didn't quite complete the training. And in the meantime, the Air Force uh, had said, no, if you want to go get your PhD in astronautics, we'll send you for that. You know, we, don't, we don't change at the graduate level. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, when I came back uh, from Vietnam, I had been promoted below the zone to major three years early. I got back uh, in September 65 and in October so or November, I was a major. So then, um, uh, I, I uh, talked to my wife and the wheels are grinding and I'm saying, well, you know, uh, I think I really need to do this. And here I was a career officer and I'd just been promoted below the zone. My ERs are out of sight. In fact, the, the, the general was in charge of the 14 Air Force. And he said to me, you know, you only have eight years to go. It shows you the perspective. You only have eight years to go. And, and you think about what can you do in eight years? <laughs> because I had not quite 12. And my buddy said, no, why are you getting out? I had some guys, academy guys call me, no, you're doing, man, you're gonna get, you're gonna wind up with two stars or three stars, you know. And I said, well, you know, I gotta make this move. So I hadn't completed combat readiness. 
in a one-on-one. So I asked to, to be dropped out of the program, and they did. Because if I'd have completed, I'd had three more years mm -hmm. that I'd have to serve. So I got out and I went back to the University of, uh, of Michigan, and I got into the MBA program there. I resigned my commission. And then I found out that I could go into the Michigan Air Guard, and I could fly fighters in the Guard. And I could do, so I could have the GI Bill, plus I could have Guard money, and I could get money for time for retirement. So I could have flown out of Battle Creek, but they were flying pushers, you know, light airplanes, a mm -hmm. twin boom pusher airplane. I don't remember what it was called. And they were, they were flying RF 84Fs out of uh, Detroit uh, Wayne Metro Airport. So I went there and they said, yeah, we're looking for pilots. And they looked at my background. And so they brought me in as a major. And, 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 they, and the Air Force then the, through the Guard gave me, uh, restored my, not a regular commission, they gave me a reserve commission as a major. Usually they knock you down, but they did. So, uh, and now I'm flying, uh, what am I flying? I'm flying uh, photo reconnaissance. So I got checked out in the RF-84F and uh, flying photo recon out of uh, Detroit Metro. And, uh, and then they uh, decided to shift uh, to uh, the F-101C. So I'm a 101 pilot already. And so then I get checked out at uh, Detroit Metro in uh, F-101. So now I'm flying 101s out of Detroit Metro and in the meantime, I'd completed the MBA and I had been accepted into the PhD program. And those guys at Michigan made me, made me take uh, the, uh, the GMAT again because I didn't have a high enough score for the University of Michigan. Even. And I scored well enough, I scored well over 700 to get in. And I was one of two people that was accepted into the program. So here I am flying with the guard and I'm in the PhD program at Michigan. And then the, uh, the unit uh, moved uh, from, uh, from Detroit Metro to Selfridge Air Force Base. And so I, uh, I completed my tour. I, I was there, um, and I stayed flying with them. And then right before I graduated, you know, now I'm going to be a full-time professor, and I got family, and I can't do this anymore, and I've got 20-some years in. So, uh, so I stopped flying, and I can't remember the year. I think it was 1973 I stopped flying um, in the 101, and they gave me command of the maintenance squadron, the aircraft maintenance squadron, uh, which was in terrible shape. They weren't doing inspections. Uh, some didn't have uniforms, and these, these are the people that come on the weekends, you know, uh, and were these leftover guys who had gone in to stay out of Vietnam? Yes, some of them were that, uh, you know, and they they'd done that. And some, uh, I think, primarily they were because you had you had your choice. And, and of course, they, when you went into guard, it was for a longer commitment. I mean, you could go into the service for what was it, eighteen two, months? Well, two years normally. Eighteen months or two years, but they could go in, and it was like a three-year commitment or something. And so, so we had these guys, and. Uh, so immediately, I start having inspections and parades, and I had some uh, senior master sergeants didn't even have uniforms that fit anymore, and I said, you, you get a uniform or I'm going to bust you. And when I started saying, well, I'm going to do this now, we're going to have inspections every uh, weekend, every uh, duty weekend, you right. know, once a month for right. two days. And they said, no, sir, you can't do that. I said, if you guys are not going to support me and do that, I'm going to bust you all, and I'll find other people to take your slots. And they had never heard that before. And here comes this hard, you know, yeah. academy graduate saying, and I did it. And they got their uniforms, and we had our inspections, and the people shaped up. And our maintenance capability went up. And we, when we were doing uh, the, 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 uh, like a tactical evaluations, you know, I would be, I was out there at night in the snow. and. Uh, and out there when it was rainy and it was 2 o'clock in the morning and they're getting the sorties and I was out there and I said, there's nobody back in the shack. You senior masters, you chief master sergeants, I want everybody on the line. They're out there in the snow, they're out there in the rain, you're not sitting back there drinking coffee. 
it was a shock. <laughs> but it worked. And we had a really good evaluation the next time through. And then, uh, then a slot uh, opened up uh, to become the deputy commander of materiel, which was a lieutenant colonel slot. And so then uh, they moved me up into that slot. So now I had all the maintenance people and all the material people, everybody, supply, all working for me. And uh, so I made it to lieutenant colonel. And in the meantime, of course, I'm not flying anymore. Um, I, they were going to open a full colonel slot for which I was the most qualified. And uh, I don't want to get into the, all the politics, but it turned out that there was somebody else who, who was reporting to me at the time, whose ERs I'm writing, um, who they gave the slot to because he only had 18 months to go to retirement. And so he could retire as an 06. And, uh, and so the, the, this officer in charge, who will be nameless, said, oh, you know, 18 months will give you the slot. And I said, sir, if that's the way you're going to run this outfit, I resign. So I resigned. And I look back, and it cost me a lot of money. But I'm an academy graduate and a principal, and things are important. Yeah. Now, by this time, did you have um, a regular academic job? By this time, I had been uh, offered, uh, offered, uh, I, I actually, I could have gone to a, a big school. But uh, my wife at the time uh, had not finished her degree, and the most credits that we could do was to go into Western. Western was a good school, and so I went to Western Michigan University and took a job there. And I never regretted it because the school just went by leaps and bounds, the College of Business, you know, and we were there accredited at all levels, and it was really, really, it was really a great choice. So I wound up being a professor of marketing at Western. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I didn't want to commute, and then this other thing had happened. And I'm not, I don't tell that story very often. Now it's going to be for everybody who wants to hear it. And I didn't name names, but uh, I couldn't believe this. So anyhow. And uh, it, w it was uh, an, an, uh, an incredible career. Uh, I don't regret it. After I finished uh, graduate school at Michigan uh, and got my PhD uh, in marketing, uh, I w which I would not, I would have gotten it in ops research or something. I was well ready to go back to the service, mm -hmm. um, you know. But they didn't have any slots, you know. So, I, and it was actually a great decision to be where I am. Um, it was a good career. Um, I feel I made a contribution. I don't understand a lot of things that happened, but I do understand a lot of things. There was a lot of misrepresentations about what's going on. And I feel like um, I made a contribution. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it, it, your story is a pretty distinctive one, especially in a lot of ways, but certainly in terms of the, the Vietnam component of it. There's not a whole lot of people who had the kind of profile that you've got or did that, and it's important to be aware of, of there are people doing what you were doing and all kinds of other things along the way. And basically you would say that the Vietnamese units that you were actually working with were, were doing their the jobs. The pilots yeah. were really good. Yeah. They flew day in, day out. They had flown for years. Their A1 pilots, O1 mm -hmm. pilots were really good. I don't know anything about, I, I can't sing about ground forces. Right. I just, and these are the cream of the crop, mm -hmm. okay. These are the best, and some of these guys had, through, through the vagaries of their life path, had gone from, and this is an exaggeration, from behind an ox cart to flying an airplane. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it's certainly an interesting and distinctive story, so thanks for coming in and sharing yeah, today. Yeah, it's my, my pleasure. Thank you.